Hello, welcome everyone to the 54th session of Libraries in Response, uh, uh, a series that we started a year and six or oh, five, five months ago, uh, just after the pandemic was declared, talking about what does that mean to libraries in particular? What, what is a library if the building is closed? Kind of an existential question. Uh, it's more than just the building, of course. Uh, what about all the services that people depend upon? Internet access, digital services, physical materials, the space itself, the role in the community, the social infrastructure that libraries play. What, is, what happens to all of that? So it was really kind of libraries in reaction, I guess we would call it. And then people started to get organized and turn their Wi-Fi out the window so at least people could connect in the parking lot and start doing curbside and you know responding, in other words. And so that we segued into libraries in response through the uh, summer, the kind of the frightening summer, and then it kind of trailed off, the pandemic trailed off in the, in the fall, and, and we kind of pivoted to, uh, to libraries in recovery in, in October. And then, of course, we had another spike, a major spike in, at the year, in, end of the year, uh, which also dropped off almost as fast as it rose, thanks to the, uh, uh, the discipline, I think, of a lot of people. Uh, in keeping uh, masks and distance and you know, the amazing phenomenon of these uh, vaccines. So that's all been rolling along and yet, and yet it's still not over. Uh, and not only uh, the, the disaster that is the pandemic, but we through last year and for actually a number of years, but especially last year, we started having some really serious sequence of uh, uh, climate-driven extreme weather events, and we're going through that yet again. So last week, it was libraries and recovery, and the weeks before that for uh, last few months. Well, we're taking a step back, and we're saying, well, we're not recovering yet. We're still responding. So we're, we're still libraries in response here because there's a lot to deal with. But thanks, everybody, for coming in today and coming back. We've got a couple of great speakers with us. Um, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, based in Sausalito, California, and we're producing this series with our partner, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutes out of The Hague in the Netherlands. And uh, uh, at the controls there is Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA, and a longtime colleague in the, in the mission to provide universal public access. It's a basic idea that everybody should be, everybody should have access. They should at least have proximate access to the open internet through some kind of a shared resource like a library or a community center. At least they should have that. And yet three and a half billion people in the world are not yet connected. It's, it's a big deal uh, for a number of reasons we're gonna get into today. Our session sponsors the Internet Society, also a long time uh, partner in, in uh, crime and these various efforts. Uh, this slide is advancing, right? Please confirm. Anybody? Yes. Thank you. Uh, infrastructure are us. Uh, not that clever, but you know that's that's what it is. Uh, the mechanics, economics, and politics of next generation communication infrastructure. We have two outstanding speakers today that can illuminate these uh, various aspects of this critical infrastructure, which is not just kind of a new infrastructure that comes along, like telephone or even electricity. So those are you know extraordinary and they are critical but this communication technology is what we use to recreate our traditional infrastructure as smart infrastructure so to us it makes telecom essentially kind of a meta infrastructure the the ring that con that controls them all that's a really big deal it's really complex and uh, it creates a lot of economies and efficiencies but also vulnerabilities. So maybe we'll touch on some of that. We have Drew Clark, the editor and publisher of Broadband Breakfast, uh, probably the leading voice on the widest range of topics related to broadband of anybody out there. And there are actually quite a few people out there talking about this stuff, but Drew's been doing it since the beginning, uh, covering great stories and publishing and getting into just all kinds of issues around broadband. And joining uh, Drew is John Busby, who I've just had the pleasure of meeting for the first time, the Managing Director of Broadband Now. 
So John also has some insights for us, and we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, it is COVID, and the COVID report, of course, is always something we touch on. And, you know, things were really looking pretty good just, you know, a few weeks ago or months ago, anyway. But now, you know, it's kind of stalled out, and there's, we know there's a whole question about variants. There's a question about uh, uh, anti-vax and people that are just not really hesitant, but they're, they're outright hostile to the idea of vaccines. And, you know, don't touch me with that stuff, that experimental thing. Uh, so th we've got a lot to work out as we always have in the US. But this is the graph from the New York Times. I should give them credit, so I will there. Uh, but this graph, uh, we've traced this graph since, well, since March of last year. And you can see what's happened. Uh, uh, and then the, the rapid fall off after the winter, and then a little bump in April, and then a nice slide down as the vaccines took hold. But now, suddenly, it's, it's really moving up at a pretty rapid clip. And so it's, you know, the jury is out. So we're going to have to see how well we do, but I hope everybody's being safe and treating, treating these variants as though we're almost in the early stages. We don't really know what they can do. We, pro we feel a little bit confident for vaccinated, but not overconfident, which I would, I'm not a health professional, but I subscribe to the advice that we mask, keep distance, and uh, encourage other people to get vaccinated. As I said earlier, this is not the only challenge that we're facing. We have got extraordinary levels, increasingly costly natural disaster events. And that excludes the social crisis that we went through last year that we're still kind of in, uh, that there's just, it's been a cascade of crises for the last year and a half. So something strange is going on, but buckle up and be ready because when disasters hit, they'll show up at your door, whether it's a, a riot in the streets or a flood or a fire, people turn to the library, even if nobody ever told them to do that because they just figure it out. That's a place to go for information and communication. Uh, one last point I want to touch on is uh, Starlink in the context of infrastructure, because this represents a new type of infrastructure, though it's it's data communications. The, the, the What's different about Starlink is the cost uh, structure. So traditional infrastructure cost models, and why we have so many people yet to be connected is that the, the cost of delivering the services is relation as relation to the distance from the core. So whatever it is, water, gas, electricity, wireline communications, wireless communications, or terrestrial wireless, the farther you are from the core, the more expensive it is to deliver services. With these satellites, these low earth orbits, uh, orbiting satellites, the costs are essentially the same, whether it's you know in downtown Chicago or outer Mongolia. It's up and it's down. I mean, there's a there's an issue related to the ground stations that have to be within a thousand kilometers, but they're the next stage of that is that they'll have satellite to satellite communications, and they won't actually need ground stations in as many places as they have. So we're going to have to see about that. We have started uh, the the LEO libraries. Uh, with a grant from IMLS, uh, the U.S. Federal Libraries Agency. Uh, we've done a number of other wireless projects in, in TV white space and CBRS and educational broadband spectrum and five and six gigahertz. And now at the end of that grant, we're using uh, some of it to explore how these, these satellites can deliver high performance broadband to areas that are just way out there and are not going to see anything soon other than than geostationary satellites, such as the Terreon uh, Community Navajo Library in New Mexico, which is now up and live and, and delivering service to its community. So it's exciting. Uh, we don't really know what it is. Is this, is this Skynet? Uh, we don't know, uh, but we think the library should be right there in the middle of it. They should be testing it. They should be vetting it. They should be reporting on it. And that's our, that's our goal going forward. So with that, I will uh, start our uh, or I'll introduce our, our speakers again, or let, let them introduce themselves in more detail. There was a, an intro in the registration page. I hope everybody had a chance to read that. But uh, with that, I will turn it over to, to Drew Clark. And uh, it is so good to see you again, Drew. Well, I can speak now. This is, this is awesome. Um, we are kind of 
uh, co-partners and we've done stuff together, cir circled around for years, but, but, but speaking particularly of this kind of uh, web, webcast webinar format, we, we literally started uh, our respective um, web, webcast series in the same month, March of 2020. Um, and, and so here's, here's what I wanna do. I'm a fan of the number three, okay? So I'm, we're gonna have three series of threes, okay? So, so the, the, the first three is um, I'm gonna speak for, I don't know, 10 minutes here, maybe, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, then we're gonna turn it to John and, and, then, and then we can bump back because I'll have a little further thoughts, uh, particularly once John goes. So that's one series of three. And then the second series of three is, I'm gonna say in my, my little remarks here, a little bit about broadband breakfast, a little bit about the history of broadband breakfast as it applies to you, to libraries, and 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 that 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 point, and then I, I hopefully the best for last. I have I have three points that I want to make that that I hope will be illuminating or helpful as we think about this topic of libraries in response. Okay, so let me start off on the first one. I want to say a little bit about broadband breakfast. Now, my hope is that all of you already know about Broadband Breakfast because we kind of are on the same wavelength. That is to say, those of you who are on this call and those of, 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 of us who come to our events. But I've just sent in the chat window a link to our Broadband Breakfast live online events. OK, this is again, this is the series we started in March, March 13th of 2020. I actually remember calling Don up and saying, Don, you can't do your event at noon because that'll conflict with ours. But but uh, and 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 we we've we've basically covered the waterfront as as Don has said uh, about broadband, the pandemic. We we perhaps put a little bit of the pandemic behind us, may, maybe more than than you have, Don. You, you very very important points you just raised about about you know distancing and, and precautions and so forth. And I may have thoughts on that later if we if we keep going. But 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 for now, I just want to say that. Broadband is, is central and vital to the response to the pandemic in so many ways. And Broadband Breakfast Live Online, our event series, uh, covers these events, but also more broadly. And we're about to start, speaking of, of social distancing, we're about to start our first in-person event, okay? Broadband Breakfast actually launched uh, eight, 12 years ago, the Broadband Breakfast Club, and that's how we got our name, Broadband Breakfast. This time around, we're not going to do a, a breakfast, or at least not an early breakfast. It's going to be 1130 Eastern time. For those in Washington, you're welcome to sign up and register and attend. But we will stream the content of the lunch at 12 o'clock Eastern time, just like we always do, 12 noon Eastern time. So that page is your page to go to learn about our upcoming events. Obviously, we do cover topics and we are reporting organization, a news organization. So I hope that you will see and go to uh, the, the, the content. There's, there's one great, great story, and, and I've probably mentioned this before. Don, I think, was kind to have, have me on this, this show um, uh, maybe 10 months ago or so. And, and it's a story, it's, it's a little bit old. It's from May of last year, uh, but it's talking about libraries and how libraries are responding to the pandemic. So I just put that out for, I sent it in the chat window for those of you who who are out there and, and want to sort of see some of our coverage that we do on, on libraries. And we have just recently launched the Broadband Breakfast um, uh, Club membership. I've just put a link to that where you get discounts to a variety of events, including Broadband Community Summit, which is happening in September in Houston. And our event will be online as well. So I want you to just kind of have all that info up front. Okay, so that's the, that's the commercial, right? And now I want to say a little bit about the history because this really does apply to you all. So would you like me to share or can I share my screen here, Don? Absolutely. Okay. It should be right there. All right. I am sharing and I am uh, going from the beginning. This is just about me, okay? In addition to being the editor and publisher of this news and event organization, I am an attorney of counsel with Comlog Group and I do a lot of, you know, uh, telecom stuff, uh, IRUs, USF, Spectrum, etc. That's just available for, for you to go to and learn more. But this really is our core belief 
better broadband, better lives. Okay, so what does that mean? That means better infrastructure and better use of that infrastructure. Okay, we started in January 20, 2008, and, and our first name was Broadband Census, okay? And that was because we were collecting data that the FCC had not published. We, you know, we actually filed a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit against them. Uh, we, we weren't successful in the short term, but in the long term, we now have disclosure of data on the census block level by carrier, and now we're moving towards the address level, and hopefully, John Busby will be able to speak more about some of these very, very exciting developments in broadband mapping. But, but we, 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 our first iteration broadband census was a means to collect data through a, a, a census, right? Of where you have broadband, how fast is your broadband and so forth, okay? We also kind of gravitated towards news uh, and the coverage of news, telecom and adjacent industries. We, we cover the infrastructure, wired and wireless, including satellites. In fact, our last event, Don, just, just two days ago was on the 12 gigahertz spectrum. So you would have liked it or you will still like it if you go to, as you can, go and watch our, our event on Broadband Breakfast. But we cover infrastructure and then we actually have a, a tag across the top of our site called Broadband's Impact. What does this mean? Well, I, I guess I probably got this idea from Charles, the late Charles Benton with whom I had the privilege of working very closely in Illinois as the executive director of the Partnership for Connected Illinois. And, and Charles had for many years been talking about the, the, the key to understanding broadband is its impact, right? And I think, you know, he helped, he and, and others helped to pr promote the idea that the national broadband plan in 2011 really did take the, um, uh, uh, to take the notion seriously that broadband is not just about the feeds and the speeds, but it's about what it does for inclusion, for telehealth, telework, um, civic engagement and the like. Okay, and so we cover those. We also cover you know, some of the, the ancillary effects, the privacy, the net neutrality, the section 230 debates and so forth, right? This is something I've kind of really maybe just realized more recently, which is that we help make some of the complexity of telecom and broadband accessible to everyone. So whether you've been studying broadband for 20 years or 20 minutes, we hope there'll be something on Broadband Breakfast for you. Just a shout out to some of our sponsors, very grateful for each of them, which enables us to keep doing the work that we are doing. And I do encourage each of you to reach out to me if you've got questions, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to love to get random emails as long as they're not spam because they, uh, they show people are paying attention and it gives feedback. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, stop my share because I'd rather you not look at a blank screen while I make these three final points. Okay, so I wanted to say that broadband helps us to see the need for um, a connected space, okay? And, and sometimes this has been called the third space, all right? And, and so like there's the home and then there's work and then there's some other place, okay? And, and there's, there's actually some great scholarship on this whole topic of the rise of cafes in 19th century Europe and cafe society. Uh, we, we, could, we could call them, you know, the, maybe churches, maybe barbershops, right? Uh, maybe community centers are that third place, right? Where do you go if you're not at home or at work, right? You don't want to be at home. You don't want to be at work. Well, libraries have really been a third space for me. I, I'm a huge fan of libraries. I, I, when I was a kid, I gravitate towards libraries. I go to libraries because they are just kind of instant knowledge and it's free. It's free knowledge. That's instant. Okay. That is huge. That is really, really huge. And, and I, again, I don't know how much you've talked about this on, on your, your, your series, Don, but I, I just, I loved the book that uh, Deb and Jim Fallows wrote called Our Towns. Have, have you all talked about that, Don? We have, we have. Okay. And, okay. and her, her point about libraries as second responders, which is a really interesting yeah. concept that we've embraced. Yeah, but yes. so she, she got into this in the book, but, but I actually heard her talk in person at Broadband Communities actually three years ago. And she just told, I mean, I was a crying, I was crying after presentation because of the 
emotional stories of the role that libraries play in helping, I may cry right now, in helping immigrants acclimatize to America, having a place to go to get access to the knowledge they needed to fill out the forms, to ask the questions. I mean, these are super important roles. And, and it's a place, I mean, the, the freeness is an important, it's, it's like, it's not, not only not a bug, it's, it's the key role, like the feature of libraries is the freeness, is the ability to go in to access whatever knowledge is there. Okay, so that, that's the, the first point of these three points I wanted to make on the third space. And libraries, in my mind, are probably the preeminent candidate. Okay, so now then, what does the pandemic do? The pandemic has just run roughshod over the third space, right? I mean, we've been basically going from our homes to our works, or maybe not even our, our works. I've been lucky. I have been able to go to this, this workspace here. And, and you know, I, I got too many kids underfoot in my house to get any work done during the day. So, so I, I need that place. And I'm glad I can now come to it. And many people, and, and again, increasingly, Don, you referred to this. I mean, I, I think we need to lean in. I mean, yeah, maybe there's some Maybe there's some pandemic -y stuff going on, but but look, if you're vaccinated, I don't think anyone has said you're at risk uh, if, if you are vaccinated for um, you know the Delta variant or whatever. So I'm I'm just going to push back a little bit, Don. And and while I'm all for caution, it's time to get over it. It's time to get back to work. It's time to do in-person events. It's time to have conferences. It's time to um, really. Uh, make up for the lost time that our kids have suffered from and and they have suffered they have suffered for lack of social connectedness during this time so anyway I, that's a bit of a rant the, the point i'm trying to get at here is that um uh all of this said we really need to think about our infrastructure and the role that libraries play in the physical as well as the impact or usage infrastructure. So my first point there about the third space is probably more about libraries as impact or as users, as we would sometimes call it, Broadbent's impact, the way libraries help digital literacy, digital inclusion, vital, 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 okay? But libraries also play a really important role on the infrastructure side. Now, what do I mean by this? So just, just on, our, on our page on, on Broadband Breakfast yesterday or two days ago, we posted a piece by, by John Windhouse. And again, I'm, I'm sure his name has come up a time or two in your discussions here. Maybe he's been, maybe he's been on your program. Um, John Windhouse and the executive director of the Shelby the Schools Health Libraries Broadband Coalition posted a, a, a piece on Broadband Breakfast just, just uh, two days ago. And his thesis was that anchor institutions and the poll attachments that they need to get access to, um, to, to uh, these facilities. And so, so where am I going with this? Um, we need to make sure we think about libraries as a place for access, okay? I've worked with many entities that want to build new fiber infrastructure in communities and they need to be able to bring the backhaul, right? I, I'm, I'm a fan of broadband mapping and mapping the fiber so that we can have a way for people who want to enter the, the marketplace. And I, just, I, don't, I don't just mean companies, I mean like communities, I mean neighborhoods that want to get out there and get fiber projects to their homes, they can connect, but they need that knowledge. They need to know where the physical access points and libraries could and should play a role in being open access hubs on these kinds of networks, okay? Maybe this idea needs to be a little more developed and I'm very happy to continue to develop it with those who, who want, but um, my point on the second point is that libraries also should be seen as a physical access point as well as a educational access point. The third point I hope is, is, is a lean in to, to John Busby here, which is to say measurement of broadband and broadband at libraries is vital. When uh, President Obama passed, uh, signed, as passed by Congress, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, of course, it devoted a good bit of funds to broadband infrastructure, as well as to digital literacy, uh, public computing centers, okay, that was part of the, the program, and broadband mapping, okay, and I had the privilege, as I've referred to, to uh, lead a broadband mapping program in the state of Illinois where we worked closely with all stakeholders uh, in the industry and elsewhere on bringing this kind of mapping. 
one part of our mandate was to map anchor community anchor institutions okay so i apologize for not being super up to speed on the state of mapping and community community anchor institutions but i i want to raise this because we want to make sure the speeds the connectivity they clearly need higher capacity 10 gigabit you know symmetrical connections or more right to libraries to accommodate the kinds of needs they have so, so those are my three points, that libraries are the third space, that libraries are physical infrastructure as well as social infrastructure, and that we need to understand the measurement of speeds and capabilities to libraries as well, of course, as the measurement of broadband to homes and businesses more broadly. And with that, I'm gonna turn it now to, to John Busby. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Drew, for that tee up, and thanks, Don, for having me, and thanks, everybody, for being here. My name is John Busby. I'm the Managing Director of Broadband Now, and before I talk a little bit about Broadband Now and also share some of the data, which I think you'll find interesting, I wanted to know if anybody here lives in Seattle or is from Seattle. That's where I'm based. All right, well, maybe not. Um, but I live, I live about eight blocks from the Douglas Truth branch of the Seattle Public Library System. That, that library branch is on 23rd and Yesler. I'm on 30th and Jackson. And prior to COVID, you'd walk into the library and on the right, there's a bank of computers and um, predominantly used by kids using the internet for homework research and just interacting with what's out there. Um, Apologies for the, for the cordless phone there. And, uh, and uh, of course, during COVID, that stopped. Um, Seattle, as you know, is a, is a wealthy city by and large. Um, when COVID hit, one of the things we realized at our, at our local school was that many of the children who attend that school do not have access to internet. And so there was an um, uh, endeavor to provide those students with free hotspots. And um, it really opened my eyes to how, how big of a deal um, that is uh, internet access is to our, our children. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what Broadband Now does and then show you some data about how big of an issue it is and why broadband measurement is so important. So I'm gonna share my screen. <clears throat> And then also, um, I'm happy to answer questions along the way. So feel free to interrupt. Um, so what do we do at, at Broadband Now? We are a data resource for consumers, concerned citizens, policymakers, and researchers about internet service in America and the digital divide. Our mission is that all Americans should have access to low priced broadband internet. And you might be surprised to hear that 42 million Americans don't. Uh, the FCC believes that it's 13 million. We strongly believe that it's significantly higher than that. And I'll explain why that is. Also, anybody can go to our site, broadbandnow.com, type in your zip code and see all the local internet service providers available. Uh, nearly a million people a year read our research and reports on the digital divide. Uh, some of the reports that we have launched in the last year include data on internet access by state. We did a deep dive about how internet access is low on tribal lands. And then also um, some research on how local and, and state laws make it more difficult for municipalities to launch their own broadband services. Here's some things uh, that we have learned about um, education. So there are 101 counties in the United States where less than half the population is wired for broadband and at least 30% of the children in those counties age five to 17 live below the poverty line. Even where I live in, in King County, 
there are an estimated 31,000 children living in poverty in a broadband penetration rate of 99%. I'd like to call attention to that 99% because why in Seattle isn't it 100%? Um, and that's because uh, internet service providers are not required to provide broadband everywhere in a, in, a, in a city. And so in some places they don't. And then something else you, you are probably aware of, we surveyed Americans last year, more than half had to cancel a health appointment due to COVID-19. Telehealth is a potential solution to this. And there's widespread acceptance of this as an alternative to in-person medical care. Obviously not having access to internet um, prevents that. I want to describe where our data comes from because it's important part of, of the measurement issue. So internet service providers are required to fill out a form uh, and submit it to the FCC twice a year, which says by census block, census block is, um, you know, there are tens of thousands of these across the United States, whether or not they provide service in that census block. Not whether or not they provide service to every household, but whether or not they provide service to at least one household. And this creates a measurement challenge because um, the FCC counts all of those situations as if the entirety of a census block is served when only a subset may be served. That's the crux between, that's the crux of the difference between the FCC's estimate of 13 million Americans without broadband and broadband now, our estimate of 42 million. In addition, we have several hundred providers who submit updates to us directly. And then what we also do is we go to every internet service provider website every month and collect all of their plan and pricing data. And we're the only organization that, that we, uh, we know of that does that. So we have a comprehensive view of how affordable internet is in every part of the United States. Um, I wanna show you what the digital divide looks like when you drill in to, um, uh, when, when you drill into our data. So a researcher on an analyst on my team, Julia pulled this data and it shows two zip codes. There's a zip code in Alabama. I, uh, I selected this because it was alphabetically first <laughs> in our long list. And then also King County in Washington, where I live. Um, it, th this is my zip code, 98144. So in my zip code, there are 26,000 people in this other zip code, there, there are 1,900. And you can see when you go down the list, uh, King County has more wired providers. We have four wired providers offering speeds of at least 25 down, three up, as opposed to the one in, in uh, Alabama, which has zero. Also, you can see that the average download speed over the past 12 months of anyone accessing the internet and doing a speed test uh, is, I'm trying to do the math here, is about 16 times faster in my zip code than it is in the zip code in, in Alabama. So when you think about uh, uh, the opportunity to be involved in the local, in, in, in our national economy, it's just much more difficult in in areas that have uh, that have less. One one also thing that that we have learned is in areas where there is less competition, prices are higher. So if you live in a rural area, there might be you you sort of have a triple triple whammy. One is um, you have less access to internet. When you do, the price tends to be higher. And then also in rural areas, incomes tend to be lower than in cities. So there's a triple, there's a triple whammy um, impacting, 
impacting folks on the other end of the digital divide. I'd like to show uh, a few pieces of research that provide more data, but before I do, I thought I'd pause and ask Don or Drew or, or anyone if you have questions or comments. I do, yeah, John. <laughs> always, actually, always do. Uh, very interesting, very interesting kind of description of uh, the, the economic drivers of deployment. And effectively, you've illustrated the failure of the market. And so this is not new. I mean, this has been broadband was never put under the universal service concept. The broadband arrived in the mid 90s. And the providers all said, we're, we're just private companies. We're like Intel and Cisco. Don't regulate us. We'll just invest where we can expect a return. So that's that. And that's what they've done. And so what they do is invest in places that people, they're, they're cheaper to serve. The flip side of you said the triple whammy is that people are closer together, cheaper to serve, and they have more money. And so they can make more profit upgrading to the people that already have a service than they can trying to reach out to the farthest, least uh, 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 economically advantaged parts of the country. So the FCC's tried to sort of intervene in that, but it's, it's, it's been pitiful that how many billions of dollars have been thrown at these companies to try to do something that they haven't done. So that's for you and, and Drew as well. But if, if you want to leave that question, it's kind of a big open question. Uh, uh, you can come to it later and we can use that as a discussion point. But if you'd like to just go ahead, that'd be fine too. Well, uh, one of the things that really our goal at, is to provide data that everyone here can use to either create policy or lobby your policy maker. So I'll just show a couple things. It'll, it'll take uh, two minutes and then we can go through, we, we can have a, a deeper discussion. So um, let me just see, I'm looking for this, uh, here we go. So you can go to um, Broadband Now's research section. I can post all of these in, in chat after I show them, but you can actually research the number of children in any county that we estimate without broadband so we've done uh we've done research on that uh we also um show by state uh what we think the true access is to coverage and access to an affordable plan and we're defining an affordable plan as 60 dollars a month or cheaper folks you may, may debate about whether that's cheap enough but that's how we have that's how we've defined it. And then, um, and then finally, uh, we have data that shows by state the FCC's opinion on how many people do not have broadband, and then our opinion and or our estimate. And our estimate is based on um, manually checking. Uh, the availability of internet for more than 55,000 addresses using uh, internet service provider tools. And we used FCC data to say which providers does the FCC say um, are available at this address. Let's go check whether they actually are. And so I invite anyone on the call, if you would like, if you would like help in in uh, getting data that you can use to lobby policy or create policy, we're very happy to share that. Excellent. Uh, and, and a lot of libraries are involved at, at different levels. And, and we have uh, librarians and library advocates from all, uh, all ranges and states. And, so at the state level, to local level, to national level, those are all policy domains, and libraries often, you know, are uh, operating at the local level. Typically, the the library itself is a local community institution, funded locally, and so having that kind of information on uh, the area around a library could be very valuable. That looks like a great work. Um, 
the number that you use of 42 million versus the FCC's completely unreliable number uh, is uh, it didn't we hear recently from Microsoft who you know has access to you know at least a hundred million homes uh, that the number was much higher than whatever the FCC said and, and I thought it was higher than 42 million. So the, the question is, uh, you know, do you agree with that? And then the other question is, why haven't all of the, the big tech companies that should know exactly what the infrastructure is? I mean, the, the carriers are not reliable reporters of these services, but Netflix knows and Microsoft knows and Apple knows all the, you know, they, down, they do download speeds to everybody. So they should have really good data down to the individual household almost. Why? Why haven't they been more forthcoming in making the case and providing hard data for us? I, I, I do want to credit um, Microsoft in working closely to provide information to uh, to the government. I have some I have some insight into that because we've we've worked together on a few a few reports. Um, I think I think where our number uh, our number comes from. Broadband now is the 42 million is is more the number of Americans who have no way to get broadband uh, wired broadband because it's it, it's not available. There is nobody that serves them, and I think Microsoft's number is a little higher than that, or maybe much higher than that, because there are a whole bunch of more people who who are not purchasing internet at that speed, Pro probably because it's too expensive. Or maybe they don't see the utility of it uh, and they, it hasn't been demonstrated. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. That's, you know, they have, you're right, uh, John, they have done a lot of work recently on, on uh, bridging the divide and, and made a goal of connecting everybody. It's, it's been laudable. Uh, the question just stands, I guess this is just fundamental telecom policy is that we electrified the country because it, we declared it a basic service. And once it's a basic service, everybody should have affordable access to it. But, and we did that with telephone service too, but we did not do that with broadband. It's something split at that point. And we've been fumbling, it seems like ever since trying to, trying to really include everybody while the providers are, are chasing increased profits in the wealthier markets. So uh, let me I jump in. Can, can I ahead. jump in? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to share uh, uh, in the chat window a couple points that, that I've made um, uh, uh, pr previously. And, and, and I wanted to do it just now because I think it's really important that we be cognizant of the different reasons for collecting broadband data. And most importantly, that we, we absolutely need to be thinking in terms of multiple speeds, right? So I, I almost don't wanna have a conversation about how many people don't have 25.3 broadband because everyone knows that 25.3 broadband is not what people need, right? So we need to have a, fil a filter. I mean, and, and I know that broadband now has a lot of these, right? And, but, but everyone talking about this should be thinking in the filter language, wait, what's the percentage that don't have service at 25.25? What's the percentage that don't have it at 50.50? What's the percentage that don't have it at 100, 100 or at 1,000, 1,000, right? And so now just to these points, these are from a, an article I wrote two years ago as the FCC was finally beginning to redo this flawed census block mapping system. But there's four groups that have an interest in broadband data and mapping. Providers that wanna offer broadband but don't care about universal service, rural telecom providers that are all interested in rural digital opportunity fund. I wanna focus on these next two points. New entrants want to bring high capacity fiber deployments to areas that currently have low capacity cable or DSL or wireless, um, as do economic development advocates. This is where libraries can play a role, right? If libraries could be hubs, could be places that backhaul could be aggregated to, that's a physical infrastructure piece that libraries could play. And then fourthly, and this is the measurement piece, academics, consumer and government oversight bodies could seek to hold broadband providers accountable. Imagine that, holding broadband providers accountable for promised levels of speed and service 
and pricing too. I didn't get into this pricing, but there's just this week been a, a new coalition launched that uh, Consumer Reports is involved in and will try to get consumers to aggregate broadband speeds, right? This is again, something we've been talking about for years when, when broadband census was around, we called it the broadband spark for speeds, prices, availability, reliability, competition. You want to be able to put all of these into the mix. And you don't want to be able to, you don't want to limit yourself to saying, oh, yeah, this is served. Let's move on. You know, they've got 25 free broadband. No, we need to be able to come back to these points John just made about, you know, there's less access, the prices are higher. Okay. And those may be legitimate or illegitimate reasons, right? I mean, there could be lots of reasons why rural broadband prices are higher, right? But maybe there, maybe they, there aren't. Maybe, maybe the, the reasons are, you know, just that that um, you know, there's 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 uh, foreclosed competition, or there's there's restrictions on new entrants, or there's restrictions on municipalities getting involved, and of course the lower income, right? That those issues. So anyway, I just wanted to, to to jump in with this this point about let's think about unpacking the infrastructure, right, Don? Don't don't let's just not harp on oh the market has failed right maybe it has, but but maybe maybe we can do something about it right and by do something about it it's, it starts with knowledge right the knowledge of where broadband is where the fiber uh, access points are and and the knowledge about what you can do with it in terms of building a new system a new fiber system a new wireless system that is competitive entrant uh, going after those uh, incumbents that are not doing what they should be doing. Well, uh, I agree about harping, and I don't need to because it's simply true that the market has failed because policy has failed to enforce universal service or broadband, uh, which it did for the prior utilities. And it, broadband has not been declared a utility, so it doesn't fall under that. Uh, we totally subscribe to the hub model. Uh, in 2007, we launched fiber to the library on that very basis, Drew, uh, that that the cheapest, most expedient, most economical way to deliver next generation broadband into every community was to run gigabit fiber to all 17,000 library facilities that would not only serve those hubs as priority endpoints where some 80 million people access the internet. 80 million people, those are people over 14, this is pre-pandemic number. Go to, the, go to the library, you know, once a day, once a year, something like that. Uh, a tremendous population, depending on libraries. And that it not only serves that priority population, but it also extends the physical infrastructure deeper into those communities and neighborhoods. Schools is an extension of that. And it was on that basis, that idea that we joined with, with uh, Charles Benton uh, and, uh, and formed the Shelby Coalition on the idea of uh, shared middle mile, middle mile infrastructure, connect the anchor institutions, which are distributed across all the communities very conveniently. And then those are either actually uh, interconnect points or they're proximate to interconnect points that allow last mile provisions to, more, to be more inexpensively done to, to reach homes and offices. And that was embraced in the Recovery Act to a large extent, several, you know, Seven four billion dollars anyway was spent on open middle mile, and it did a lot. There were there were hundreds of those projects that that followed that model, and then there have been many hundreds more that have done interconnect on that. So uh, we that's the that's our address. Uh, that's our response to uh, the market. Even even if the providers don't see profits out there, those communities that have an opportunity to self-build, and we've seen that. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit, the, the community networking uh, phenomena that we've seen so much about, where people are just not waiting to be served. They're going, well, we can do something here. We can, you know, DIY infrastructure. Is that, what, what's the story on that, Drew? Well, I'm, I'm happy to go into that. That's another hour, though, uh, Don. So so I, I definitely want to get some questions and thoughts and comments from our, I mean, we got a bunch of people on this call and some I know, some I don't know. But 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 I am very happy to go into this because there are lots of, pro you can read about them on Broadband Breakfast. I'll put one in, in the link here uh, about entities that are saying, let's go out and get these connected ourselves, literally, right? And And there are business models that are out there uh, as, as many of you know, I, I mean, like I'm a huge fan of, of helping to get open access networks off the ground because 
we we got to stop thinking about and and I think I think this has this has been happening over the last you know ten years particularly the last five years three years people are going beyond the notion oh yeah Comcast they're the ones who take care of broadband oh oh Verizon they're the ones who take care of broadband. oh AT and T they take you I mean sure they offer some services right but they are not the be all and end all to your broadband uh, ecosystem, right? There's going to be a mixture of backhaul and middle mile and last mile. There's going to be players in the who own infrastructure, cities. There's going to be communities. There's going to be homeowners associations, right? Uh, there's there's going to be operators and there's going to be service providers that offer services on these networks, different and apart. You know, certain telehealth services are being offered on on some 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 networks that that, that simply were, were not uh, offerable on, on others. So anyway, those are some of the topics that we'll get at when we when we have that follow on conversation, Don, about this this point. But um, uh, but I, I want to hear from some of our, our panelists or our, our, our I attendees. Too. I put uh, I asked for questions here, uh, and uh, we've got calling them by name, Don. You know, pick somebody. We have kind of a shy group today here. Uh, Dennis, Hello. you've got your video on uh, to tell us, <laughs> tell us your thoughts. Well, so I am the director of a small public library in Northwest Michigan. And so, uh, and I've been lurking, I have to say just lurking <laughs> primarily on a number of these meetings. And while I feel much better educated where I still end up landing is philosophically, I'm right with right with all of you, but where I still get a little stuck is where, I mean, what literally like from the ground, what is it that someone like myself who, who I think understands the need can get behind, um, get behind the value of what we're talking about. And before I'll answer part of my own question in the sense that talking, having you all talk about broadband mapping. And I mean, that is something that I plan to start poking around with just to see because most of what I felt for my area here is more a hunch than it is concrete data. So I'm curious, I'll, I'll be looking at my my zip code month. So I'll be looking at some of that to see specifically what what kinds of services being provided and where are the gaps and that sort of thing. But so that's that's part of my question. And, and so I am in Michigan and I know that there are some initiatives here in Michigan, um, the Library of Michigan, but that's, that's how I actually got connected to this group in the first place with some of the workshops that, that they were doing. But so that's, that's a great, fairly open ended kind of question. <laughs> no, that's 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 a great perspective. Uh, and what we've heard uh, is that libraries can act as conveners of this kind of a conversation. You don't have to be a subject expert on frequencies and fiber and so forth, but as a trusted entity, you can bring a community conversation together and facilitate that. You can draw some data from John and uh, and present that, saying, "Are we happy with this?" What kind of options do we, you know, and uh, and run a conversation like that and get the stakeholders, of course, and and uh, that's that seems to be really effective. We've seen others do that. Here's a question. It's come in. Do you want to read it, Don? You want me Go to ahead. read it? Go ahead. Virginia DeMumbrum writes, I'm from a small library in Michigan, struggling to find our place in the infrastructure area, working with local municipalities to leverage ECF monies, but finding what the time the timetable is much too short. Let me say a word or two about that, okay? The uh, emergency broadband benefit and the emergency connectivity fund. And we've, we've done webcasts, actually one on the emergency broadband benefit on broadband breakfast, but um, not yet on the ECF. So maybe we need to do one or we could do one with you, Don. Um, the ECF is pretty much a extension of the the, um, the the e rate program emergency broadband benefits an extension of the lifeline program for low income individuals and um, by timeline is much too short Virginia do you mean to say that that um, putting an application in is 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 a hardship I mean there there was a a good bit of fund seven point one billion allocated through this 
fund and 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 like with EBB, they were going to be available until spent. But okay, Virginia has answered. We can't build out what our area needs in one year. So um, so in other words, you're talking about using ECF funds to do your own build out. Is is that right, uh, Virginia? Okay. She's saying she can't build that in one year, of course. Uh, but the ECF is really for, it's not for infrastructure, it's for devices, you know, for computers and mobile hotspots. It was a kind of a disappointment to a lot of people, but that's what they decided on was that they would allocate this money so that students and patrons could have, you know, connectivity yeah. without really dealing with the backhaul. Right. Well, and, and this is this is why, you know, we need a, a flexible broadband infrastructure plan. Obviously, this is still very much in the negotiation phases. I mean, some people were focused a lot on the number. Is it going to be 100 billion or 80 billion or 20 billion end up being 65 billion? At least that's the current deal. I mean, I am less concerned or focused on that number than I am the rules that will go with it. Right. What requirements, if any, will there be on uh, open access, what what uh, uh, limitations, if any, will there be on municipalities? Will the, the federal government kind of preempt states that have, you know, more than 20 states have restrictions, although the number's gone down, gone down slightly, right? So because because people are finding they're very, un restrictions of this sort are very unpopular because people want more options for broadband. And even in, even in places like, uh, you know, um, uh, Tennessee and and uh, um, uh, 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 Ohio. Obviously, there was an attempt to to, to, to close down uh, Muni broadband, but that was that was lifted. So, so the point the point I'm making is that the 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 rules that go with the infrastructure are quite important, and and we need to be thinking about things like this. Um, all right, there are more questions here. I'll let someone else read one and take one. I was going well, to ask John if, if he had a minute to uh, respond to. Uh, pastor's question there. It seemed like it was right for you, John. Let me let me look at it. Okay. I'm interested in trying to get broadband in our township as a trusted library resource hub that's being part of the park membership and possibly heading toward uh, a township utility. I need some data to fight this fight, make it available. Pastor, um, please, please reach out to me by email and I can get you some of the data that you need. I'm just going to type my email here in the um in the chat for everyone okay that's great um and uh and then i'm sorry everyone i need to drop off a little bit early i have a commitment at the top of the hour i just cannot get out of all right um, this has, oh, been, this all has been really today. fun thanks a lot and good work uh and thank thanks you. for making the time today we'll look forward to a follow-up uh, we'll get drew we'll get we'll get in the mud with this stuff a little bit again awesome all right thanks everybody have a great weekend bye Okay, Drew, you want to take a shot at any of this? Uh, Lori? Yeah, yeah I, I can stick on for, for another, you know, 10 minutes or so. Okay, so, great, so, great. Um, so very happy to. So um, let me just make sure we got Pastor, Pastor's question addressed. Um, getting broadband to our township as a trusted re, re, library resource hub that is deemed part of the membership and possibly heading towards a township utility. Uh, some need for data uh, and an engineering proposal. Um, so, um, data proposals, creative methods to share with others. Uh, well, well, I, not necessarily a question there, Pastor, obviously you've got John's, uh, email there. I'm going to go ahead and put my email, which I had on that previous Good. screen okay. there, but please Hello, feel free to, possible for me to jump in on that. Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. That was me typing that in. And I think I can do it better by just saying it. And that is, yes, um, we're trying to get broadband in this small township poverty driven and doesn't really have capability. Um, we do have a fiber connection that comes to the library, uh, but trying to get them to come over to the library or even extend beyond the wall is something that we're trying to do because of the students, teachers, and everything in this area that can't have, don't have really internet access, not at a good price range, um, and, and then it's not even really reachable for them to turn around and get it. So we, we did go out to a uh, uh, networking um, um, provider that came up with some proposals of towers and all that stuff off the extend from us. But the question is, even working with the, the government of, of um, the library providing a hub 
and even working with the city hall to turn around and allow this to be more of a utility project of allowing it to be available to all in what we call, and I didn't put the words in there, a Wi-Fi zone that <laughs> the small area is covered under an umbrella. And the whole thing is to get two things, internet to each other, and then also communication. There's no newspaper. There's no way to let people know what's going on. There's no, but by putting this and allowing them in their cell phones, computers, whatever, to have some kind of um, access to an email or something, newsletter, they can find out what's going on in the city, whether it's food giveaways or anything else, coming from a trusted source of the library while providing some kind of way for them to be able to touch utility, I mean, touch internet and technology. So that, I, I was listening to how you, how the, this subject been going on about getting it out to everybody and letting everybody be able to get in touch with it and different things to access that. This is one project I've taken on to myself. So um, that's really the story behind it. Well, Pastor, that's great because that's what it takes is somebody that really is committed to it. Uh, how big? How big is your town? It's a small town. It's two. It's it's um. What is? I think it's three square, um, square miles. Um, it's a small town and it has like two thousand five hundred. It's a All township, right. very very small, where a Wi-Fi zone could probably turn around. And hopefully that's a be a start of a module that spreads out on little towns that's around all our edges. We're we're seeing that. Uh, we talk about rural areas as being very low density. And when you look at the county level, that's what you get. But when you see where people actually live, they usually live pretty close together in a small town, maybe a mile across. What that means is if it could mean anyway, is that you do have a strong backhaul. You could look at, it well, sounds like you're already doing it, uh, setting up a Wi-Fi mesh network that could provide coverage across the area there. That's exactly and, and, what we're trying to do and look into and trying to figure out how we can turn around and do that. Even when we talked to somebody, they said that even though all of these fundings might not, the E-rate might not apply, the e ECF or the new ones might not apply, but there's a lot of different places that we might can go to get some supplemental funding to try to make this happen. Absolutely. So, I would just say, Pastor, I, I, you know, there may be this may be worth the follow up conversation. I'd be happy to have reach out to me via email. Sounds like you got a couple of very exciting things going on, both in terms of the infrastructure and the media connection. Um, but but, uh, you know, let's let's kind of move on to a couple other things. S Sarah Pete, I believe, uh, pronounce it Pete, uh, has made a very good point here. Don, do you want to do you want to highlight this? I was not aware of this webcast, but it might be very appropriate for this audience here. Wondering if your library should apply for the Emergency Connectivity Fund, ECF, but aren't sure about the requirements or eligibility. Uh, jointly hosting ECF, yes, of course. Uh, Shelby has been at the forefront, as has ALA, on uh, exploring and illuminating the ins and outs of ECF. The, the issue is, yeah, I, I, would, I would join in to that, uh, yeah, that's in an hour. That's in two hours. So, so that that yeah. that could be really, really. And these these are the people who know the issue ins and outs. So, I would definitely uh, yeah. join that. Um, yeah, uh, you're, just, you're just not going to build infrastructure with that money. It sure looks like you're going to be able to connect people uh, through cell networks, essentially. Uh, but you you're not going to be able to solve pastors' problem. I think with that though. Though maybe, maybe you could build a Wi-Fi network that satisfied the ECF requirements to connect homes. So check in uh, with the experts in a couple of hours. Hey, um, Don, K Kelly Cole of um, the state of Utah, uh, she, she's available to, to address some of these points here. So uh, Kelly? go ahead and turn Hi. on your camera. I'll mute yourself. Thanks. Uh, I'll turn on my camera. Hold on one second. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm in t t-shirt and casual today. So hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so what we're doing is so I'm with Utah Education and Telehealth Network. And so we are the consortium applicant for the state of Utah. Um, so the state E-rate coordinator resides in our office. And so what we've been doing over the last month or so is, um, so we've been reaching out to all of our libraries and all of our districts um, and we've offered basically three options. We've offered an option where um, they file on their own, but we offer assistance sort of like category two, because typically we do their category one, but they do their category two. 
So, but in this case, we've offered to help with the application, help actually do the application for category for ECF. Um, the other option is they can just do it on their own and just let us know so that we know that they're taken care of. And then the third option was to, um, to just do training and help them to do it. And then they do the application. I guess there's a fourth option. And then the fourth option is we're trying to do um, a consortium application with our libraries. So we're working with our state library and we are trying to figure out if we can, if the state library can own the equipment and then put it out into circulation to all of the libraries. And interestingly, during the CARES project, UETN had gotten some money and two of the projects that we subgranted to, one was a home internet project for the school. So we gave $5 million to the schools to do home internet for kids. Um, and we were able to, we were able to cover about 7,000 homes with that. And then we also did um, a subgrant to the state library and the state library reached out to the libraries and they did, um, internet access through the library. So interestingly, we happened to pilot the two things that ECF is doing. And so that was really helpful. Um, so what we're finding so far, it looks like the larger districts are going to do it on their own, like a category two, we're going to help some of the smaller districts and then, um, and then the libraries, we're going to try and do a consortium for them. Um, I think the trickiest thing if you're doing, um, I think the hardest thing on the timeline is having the schools identify which kids have needs. It's a little bit easier for the libraries because they can kind of do a pool of devices that can go out in circulation. Um, and the libraries are going to have to figure out some sort of certification. That's one thing that was missing from our program. But we feel really lucky that we sort of already piloted something like this. So some things have been worked out a little bit. And then we also are able to, since we're at the University of Utah, one thing that we're trying to do, so UEN is an independent state agency, but we're housed in the university. And so what we're trying to do with devices right now is we're actually working through our campus bookstore contract to see if we can purchase devices through an existing contract so we don't have to go off to RFP for Chromebooks and things like that. Um, so it's, it's been a lot. I think the hardest thing is getting the kids, especially if you're doing, if you're doing like a wired home option, identifying those homes to do any kind of procurement is really difficult. A hotspot is a little bit easier, but that's not ideal if you're only getting 15 meg on that hotspot. So lots of things are going into it. And our state rate coordinator, Jerome, that many of you know, is very busy. So we're just supporting him and trying to get him through it. That's great, Kelly. Uh, you you make a commercial for uh, for being innovative uh, because right. it's going to give you a body of knowledge, right, to make you ready for things that happen that maybe are not quite predicted, or or a program like this comes along and you you have experience that gives you an advantage. Uh, you, it also you also make a commercial for the RENS, the State Research and Education Networks, who do outstanding work in connecting anchor institutions from a motive which is very different from the, than the carriers, uh, providing sophisticated uh, internet uh, uh, service to anchor institutions. And you know, the, very, the very entities that actually built the internet, are, right? This is yeah. for the universities that, didn't, that wanted to all be connected, but they didn't want to build those networks. So they created these, these entities, the, the research and education networks to build the networks who then started reaching out and doing the colleges and the schools and the libraries and the health clinics and so forth. So it's just an amazing story. So, well, and I would say even with everything that we're trying to do, I don't think we're going to get all the districts like to get done in time. Like even with all the outreach and things that we're doing, it is a heavy lift. So I think even with all of that, like, I don't think we're going to be perfect in getting everything done either. So if people are feeling bad, like, don't, because it's really it's hard. An to get emergency. Done. It's an emergency. Contrary it's to what Drew really may hard. think, we're still in an emergency here. And so yeah. whatever you can do is what you can do. And you shouldn't yeah. you know, beat yourself up because you can't do what you would do if you had plenty of time. Uh, we are, speaking of time, we are kind of over time. So I want to turn it back to Drew for a final comment, and then we'll sign off on our uh, session here. We'll hang out for a little bit after that. Drew, uh, final word. Sure, sure. No, thank you. I just want to thank everyone for being a part of 
this discussion. As I said at the top, um, uh, Don and I have uh, traveled on parallel paths and, and, and most recently uh, with uh, the pandemic, we, we've, we've both been um, doing a lot. I guess outreach is really the only way to describe it. Um, I, I want to just put on everyone's calendar, I've just sent a test message, the, um, the Broadband Communities Summit and our event, Digital Infrastructure Investment. The logo that you saw on your email inviting you to participate in this is our logo for the Digital Infrastructure Investment. And that is the page for, um, for learning about that conference and registering for it. I haven't shared that one yet in this call. I just want to close by thanking you, Don, for this opportunity. And to, to, to reiterate that, that I think that libraries are, are vital uh, to uh, being that place of education, the way uh, Deb and Jim Fallows talked about in their, in their, in their book. Um, I, I want to just close by repeating that we cannot forget the role. And I, I really invite any of you who, who have further thoughts on this or wanna, and this is a very embryonic movement, so to speak, but, but let's think about how libraries can be a hub for, I mean, even, even if you did, and thanks for pointing out, Don, you did this in 2007, I should go back and look at that, you know, send that to me so I can look at that because I wanna see how we can kickstart that or revive that or what role libraries could play in this in a new infrastructure bill. And, and again, just to kind of recap that we, we need to make sure our measurements are, are public and available and we're, we're collecting things like speeds and price and availability and, and, and reliability and competition in addition to just saying, oh yeah, coverage is here. Well, it's not, it's not there. You know, there's, there's many reasons why we do mapping and measurement and, and uh, uh, we can't just think of them all as being one. So those, those again are my, my, my three points and I thank you uh, to each of you for being here with us and I am going to, uh, to say goodbye and, and see you later, okay? Drew, well, uh, let me thank you and, and ask everybody to unmute if you would, please everyone unmute, because if we were together and soon we will be able to be together in a room having, you know, this would be an extraordinary presentation we just had, we would give our speakers a round of applause. So that's what we're gonna do right now is give Drew and John a round of applause. So everybody, thank you. Thank you very much. Drew, we'll have you back and we left a lot on the table and I think we ought to do another session in a month or two and, and get into it. All right, all right, wonderful. Take, take care, bye-bye.